welcome to One Plus One. My name is Rodney Gibbons. I'm a Palawa man from Lutterwitcher, Tasmania. We are standing at Purikitna at the moment on the banks of uh, the Nipaluna. And we're just going to have a bit of a chat today about this country, what it means to Palawa people, and how we see our destiny and our future. Enjoy the journey. Rodney Gibbons, thank you for welcoming us to Lutruwita, Tasmania. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. So this place, Lutruwita, Tasmania, renowned for the stunning environment, the bush landscape, the architecture, the amazing food, the art scene. What makes this special as your home? The fact that we have looked after and preserved this land for 65,000 years and the fact that we have not gone away, that we have a presence in the land that I think fulfills our commitment to it. Well, like any, any Indigenous person, this is your country. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have an obligation to look after it and hunt it um, and to live, and just to live as a people. Now, you've got to remember that this land was given to us by the spirits that walked down from the stars and it was our obligation to actually look after this land and do it. We're part of the land. Well, we're in Hobart where you live now, but you were born and raised up north in Launceston. Mm. What was your mm. memory of that time? I, I would say that Launceston for me, uh, growing up, was quite difficult. When I was very, very young, we lived out of Launceston at a place called Nabola and then mum and dad got a housing commission place in Mayfield in Launceston. And that's where a, a very large number of um, Aboriginal people from Cape Barren in particular had settled coming off the islands. So we had that um, connection there, but um, we weren't connected to the entire community, if you like. It, for some reason or other, we weren't liked very much. I went to primary school in Mayfield and it was a very difficult time. I'd walk out of the buildings at the end of each day. I'd look up and down, see what's there. If there was a gang uh, of young white school kids, I'd turn the other way and go. Almost every day, I'd be chased home by these packs of kids. And if I ever got caught, I was given a flogging. I learned how to run very fast. Sometimes I reckon I'd run two, three mile, ride around the back of houses, through, jump into the bush and go down to the back of our house where we lived and climbed over the fence and home. And then um, Dad got a job in Burnie and uh, we had to leave Launceston and I, I must admit, I don't think I was very disappointed. And then we got to Burnie and then I realised I should have been disappointed. The attitudes of the people were the same anywhere. They were just simply terrible. They, um, they didn't like to look on people um, fondly if you were different, and we were different. We were just a little bit darker and we had no qualms in saying where we come from, from Cape Barren Island or from this land. And tell me about Cape Barren Island and and your family and how then uh, they ended up being in Launceston? Well, I wasn't born on Cape Barren, I was born in Launceston. Dad was born in Launceston. Uh, his mother, Nana, uh, she left Cape Barren, must have been uh, before the 1920s. Uh, but my mother lived there um, till she was probably about 17 or 18, I think. They were ardent Cape Barren Islanders. There was no doubt about that. They were totally comfortable in their own skin and they would tell people that's who they were. So at home, you were learning about that connection and, and your place, but it was different at school, wasn't it? Because at that time, there was this real myth that Aboriginal Tasmanians, Palawa people, your people were dying out. And, and in fact, that the last was Truganini. In 1976, 
Tasmanian police carried the ashes of Traganinia, the last Tasmanian Aboriginal. We were too young to actually figure out and understand what um, calling Traganini as the last Aborigine on this, on this state in Lutterwitcher actually meant to us. They were basically saying we didn't exist. And you'd be thinking, hang on a minute, what are we? This week on Monday Conference, the last Tasmanian. In uh, 1876, the last Tasmanian died. That is to say, the last full-blood Tasmanian Aborigine died. Her name was Truganini, and with her death, a whole race of people also died, and a culture vanished from the face of the earth. Well, that's according to a film showing at the state cinema. I guess all of that began to change in the 1970s when the whole political arena for Aborigines in the, in the nation was changing and we were no different. We were starting to stand up for our rights and starting to stand up for who we are. We are the only race of people that I know of on earth, Tasmanian Aborigines, that have to daily justify our existence. We knew at that stage we were different. We knew at that stage we had connection to land and country and to each other and we knew we were black. And that was the main thing. We knew we were Aborigines from this state, so we set out to change the view of everybody uh, that um, Truganini was not the last. She was simply a sad face of racism and discrimination that was delivered against us all. I'm just curious, Rodney, there's a term that you've used, Aborigine, and, and language has shifted quite a bit and there are some people that r refuse or won't use that word and will say Aboriginal people, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people or Palawa people. What's your view on that about language? Well, I guess, like, when I was growing up, um, we were... Uh, basically Cape Barren Islanders, then we were a half caste, then we were blacks. And we were happy with that in the sense that people were seeing us as a distinct people. And of course, the term Aboriginal came into play nationally, and that was being bandied about the, all of the states. But here in Tasmania, for some reason or other, and I don't know why, we always use the term Aborigine. Now, for me, the use of the word Palawa uh, has only been a recent thing for me, 10, 10 or so years, if not a little bit longer. Uh, so I interchange the words even though I don't want to because as far as I'm concerned, we are now Palawa. <laughs> Tell me about your military service mm. around the time of Vietnam. It follows on from um, my experiences in Launceston and in Burnie. The racism was just intolerable. I'd had enough. I guess from my point of view, you could say I was nearly quite a frightened young man. I had no confidence. Uh, in what I was about and what I was doing, and I just wanted out. There had to be something better. I knew that the army was enlisting, so I joined. Joined at the age of 17, and I was always treated equally and as one of them. We stood side by side as comrades, and we stood side by side, very importantly, as friends, and friends who had each other's backs. And I thought that was, that was a good, important lesson for me, that I'm equal, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing to be shoved underfoot by you fellas. So what was it, Rodney, that made you then want to return to country when you'd found that equality? My obvious answer to myself was it's home. Uh, that's where I belong, that's where I come from. I'm, I belong to Tasmania. They had uh, Aboriginal employment programs running at that stage and uh, I had a cousin, Clyde, who was uh, working uh, in that system. He managed to, to um, get me a uh, traineeship that ran for 
two years. And under that uh, traineeship, I was working with a bloke by the name of Jimmy Everett, who I reckon is well known nationally and internationally around here as an, as an artist. And he actually taught me a fair bit. And more and more, I was picking up on um, the state's relationship with the Aboriginal population of the state. And that led to your work as the manager of the Office for Aboriginal Affairs here. One of the biggest moments must have been the land rights legislation that led to the return of Palawa land, including where we're sitting right now. Including where we are now. Yes, 1995. When that land was handed back in 1995, it was fair to say we were renewing its spirit. The land had once and for all been returned to the Aboriginal community of this state, of this country, the Palawa people. This is where the invasion of our country first started with Bowen in 1803 and in the land that was then called Van Diemen's by the white man. It's always been Ludowicza by the black man. Mm. So they came up here they felt that, that this might be a nice place for them to start their um, prison colony. They decided that it was their country. They asked no permissions, did not try to talk to the Palawa people that were here at the time, mm. and decided that the gun would be better off speaking for them. So tell me, Rodney, about this monument. Well, it was obviously put up by the white fellas here uh, to commemorate Lieutenant Bowen coming into Risdon Cove, as it uh, has been known as, to basically celebrate the formation of the, the colony. But really all it means is this, this is the point that celebrates the invasion of our country. I must admit I was a little bit taken aback when I saw that it had been painted with red with a big cross in shame written on it. But when you think about it, you can understand it. Like, this is young people now learning about their history and understanding that there was a white invasion of this country that took away their land, their culture, their language. So I can understand it. I, I'm a bit disappointed in a way, but I can certainly understand the feeling that drives people to do this stuff. And not far from here, there is a very bloody confronting history, isn't there, for yeah, your people? Yeah. Well, the very first massacre that we know of um, basically happened over, over in that um, uh, hillside over that way. And it pretty much was a few hundred Aboriginal men and women just hunting and uh, moving along, minding their own business, basically and then they were spotted by soldiers and shot on. There are lots of views about how many people were massacred there, but you've made a really important and powerful point, I think, that one life taken is one life too many. Well, it is when you think about it, like these are Palawa men and women and children walking on their land. A white man comes with a gun that shouldn't be here. They raise the gun and they shoot. One life is one life too many from an uninvited group, from an invader. I guess what we're discussing and, and touching on is recognising and acknowledging what's happened in the past. And in 2021, the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery apologised for their past actions of removing and trading Aboriginal remains for collections. We are unreservedly sorry. What did that mean to you? At that time, I'd have to say that meant a lot. Uh, the museum, uh, over the years, really had been a... Um, a, a force in moving um, uh, Aboriginal issues forward. And this was at the conclusion of that, like 
When we battled them over the Crowther collection, um, they were pretty intransient. They did not like us at all. One of a number of Tasmanian collectors was Sir William Crowther. Dr Crowther gave his collection of bones to the Tasmanian Museum, where they are still being held. When the Aboriginal community was getting um, its voice, really its voice and its strength together, we wanted all of those people returned to us. They needed to be put to rest in the ceremony. And I did the ceremony for the, for the cremation of all of these people. And there would have been over 300, uh, 400 Aborigines there witnessing this. And the absolute pleasure and joy that all of these people got by just simply being there. The farewell, their old people to release their spirit and let them go. Edinburgh University has one of the largest collections of Aboriginal remains. Next Wednesday, Rodney Gibbons and Denise Gardner will fly to Scotland to bring them home. You've been a part of other repatriations as well. Tell me about when you went to Edinburgh. At that stage, um, the community had got a little bit of success of getting some returns of remains from overseas. Uh, Michael Mansell in particular had started most of that. And uh, my cousin Denise Gardner and I were selected to go across to Edinburgh to, to get back a number of other remains that were stolen from the northwest coast and the skull of William Lanny. So we did. Today saw an emotional welcome for nine of those skeletons, including the skull of William Lanny, said to be Tasmania's last tribal male. Rodney Gibbons and Denise Gardner made the long trip to collect what they could of the more than 200 skeletons being held in universities and museums across Europe. These lots of people are just going to be buried and taken care of in, in, the, in the fashion that should have been done a long, long time ago. It's pretty personal, isn't it, when you're bringing home the remains of what's left of your ancestors. And I understand that you're going to be receiving blood and, and hair samples soon as well. What does that repatriation mean to you? Well, that one's very personal. Um, Norman Tyndale went across the Cape Barren in 1929, 1932, around that era. And what he did uh, was line up about 185 Cape Barren Islanders and he took photos of every single one of them, uh, uh, almost like a mug shot, a straight on face shot and then a side angle shot uh, and then proceeded to take hair samples and blood samples uh, from a number of those people. My mother and her two parents uh, had hair samples taken from them and my grandfather had a blood sample taken from him. And recently, the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre had been successful in getting those remains returned uh, to this state. The remaining members of my family, at least all of the grandchildren, were looking at cremating the hair samples and blood samples um, next to their graves. I want to go back to your last job before retirement. You're a policy manager at ATSIC for South Australia and Tasmania. Mm. What did you see as the role of ATSIC? Right. That is a good question in, in, <laughs> in lots of ways. It's, it's the topic of conversation so often, isn't it? Yes. Um, ATSIC was really, geez, you'd have to say one of the most forward-thinking attempts at trying to get Aborigines involved in policy, policy making and being in control of their own destiny. And that's exactly what it was going to do. Um, my role was to ensure that we um, got policy development up through the regional council in this state and in South Australia and through to the commissioners who then discussed 
the development of those policies at a national level and got government to fund them and put them in place. ATSIC, I think, was maligned unfairly by the government, particularly the final years of ATSIC under John Howard. Um, and I also think it was unfairly maligned by a number of um, Aboriginal community members and organisations. Now, I'm not saying ATSIC was the perfect mechanism because it was far from it, far from it. But we were sorting that out, moving through it. And I think when ATSIC was shut down under the, the Howard government, that was one of the most disgraceful things that I think government could ever have done. Tired now, but you're mm. certainly <laughs> not finished. You're, you're still pretty busy. You're the chair of uh, Tulupra Tuna Pray, which I understand means light the fire of understanding, understanding yes. which is just a mm. spectacular uh, term. You're pushing for treaty and truth telling through this organisation, aren't you? Yes. We are a, a community selected group and we are committed to making sure that treaty and truth telling is the bit that's brought in to this state and, and done uh, with the community being fully involved. Now, the government, as you may be aware, has another way of doing that in mind. And this that you're referring to, this is the uh, 2021 announcement, I think it was, from the then Premier about a state approach to truth-telling and treaty, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. And, and so where is that at now? Well, it's a bit of a quagmire, really, isn't it? It's a, um, well, quagmire, a bit of a standstill. Um, our group has uh, developed a draft legislative piece for the government to consider about putting together uh, a treaty commission of some nature. And uh, we think that the government should develop that further in conjunction with the Aboriginal community and just get on with it, for goodness sakes. We're having a national conversation at the moment that's including truth-telling and uh, treaty-making. The Uluru Statement from the Heart calls for voice treaty truth in that order. You were there for that summit at Uluru in 2017. What was your experience? Well, that was how it came out in the document. That was not my recollection of the way it should have been presented to government or to the Aboriginal community nationally. There was a very strong agreement on treaties that are respectful for all of the different mobs. The view was that treaty was the prime uh, thing that was coming out of Uluru that all the delegates wanted. The majority of delegates wanted treaty first with, with truth telling advising how treaty would happen and then out of that comes the voice. If you have a voice that under the government position now has no power, then I ask you what is the value of a voice? Well the advocates would say that it can make those representations and that they would need to be listened to. Is that the kind of forcefulness that you think is needed? No. No, of course not. The current arrangement of that voice is to simply be this meek little thing that says, I want A, B, C. And the government says, fine, and that's it. Have you decided how you're going to vote? Pretty much. I certainly, under no circumstances, will, will vote no. I will not be party to the crap that Dutton and the National Party are coming out with currently. But I can't vote yes, because I don't think that the government of the day um, and, and uh, the supporters of the yes votes have explained to people like me enough to convince me that is the right way to go. And I am also um, 
um, beholden to the fact that uh, I chaired the regional dialogue here in Tasmania and that dialogue was adamant that it was treaty first with truth telling, then maybe a voice. So I won't vote no, but I'm not voting yes. I think I'm going to do that little thing of putting a little box under the box that's going to be there, ticking that and saying treaty now, treaty first. Is there the risk though that if essentially if that was a, a donkey vote, that that is an essentially a no vote? No, it's not. No. no, no. People say that to me, but I'm not saying no to the voice. What I'm saying is no to the current impression of what that voice would be. I guess there can't be a sense, can there, that if you vote no or write an extra box onto the ballot paper, that that will deliberately lead to a treaty, though? No. No, you're, you're quite right. We don't know whether doing that type of thing would lead to a treaty, but I'd ask you to cast your minds back to the Franklin River debate when Tasmania held a referendum type thing over the two dams they wanted to build. Now there were two boxes and the Greens of the day put up a solid campaign of saying no dams to actually put a third box in and just write next to it no dams. 31% said no dams and in the end there were no dams. There was building up a reflection of what the population truly thought. It's the same with the voice. I don't want to say yes to a voice, but I don't want to say no to a voice without a treaty being reflected. The treaty, as I've said before, is where we should be heading. You spend a lot of your time talking to younger people about country, about culture, about connection. What does it mean to you to be an elder? <sighs> First of all, I'm going to have to let you know that I don't consider myself as an elder. I consider myself as an old man. To my view, I think the term elder in this state has been abused. I think there are a number of people that use that title based on the fact that they want a perceived status and a perceived power. But it's not all about that. It's not about that at all. It's about respect. And I think I get a, a, a fair bit of respect from my community as it is, and I appreciate that. You don't know how much I appreciate that. And it's respect on the knowledge, and I hope respect on the support and the help that I give them in their own journeys. I had that from my relatives and from the older people that I knew, and I'm hopeful that I'm doing the same thing. Rodney Gibbons, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for joining me on One Plus One. Oh, pleasure's all mine, I tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.